So welcome to Lab Chat. We are here with Mary Alikian from the Imperial College London who is focused on CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, and her research is of interest today uh, for us. But first, you know, Mary, welcome to Lab Chat. Thanks for joining Thanks. us. Uh, Thank you, Daytime Jeremy. here in San Francisco. I know you're finishing your day there in London, um, so appreciate your time. Uh, first, let's get into CML. Can you kind of break it down on the molecular level of what's happening? So CML, as you described it, is called chronic myeloid leukemia. So it's a type of leukemia that is uh, chronic. So it takes a long time for people to discover the disease is there. And then once you discover it, it stays with you for a long time. So um, so the cause of Philadelphia is so the cause of CML at the molecular level is a little chromosome called uh, Philadelphia chromosome. And it's a reciprocal translocation between two chromosomes, which is 9 and 22. So it's naturally doesn't exist in our cells, but because of this exchange between two chromosomes, uh, this uh, um, uh, onco-chromosome, let's say, comes together to, to form Philadelphia chromosome, which has the, the result of it is a fusion gene that's called bcr able So it's two genes fused together and it's active gene, so it becomes an oncogene that's continuously active in our cells and it triggers all sorts of uh, signals to make the cell proliferate and grow and cause cancer. Uh, so that's the molecular background of it. Um, now, let's talk about what that means for uh, patients that deal with this disease and, and monitoring it over time. Can you kind of get into that on, you know, what you think, you know, it might, someone might be uh, in remission um, or even deep remission, but, um, you know, there's, there's sort of been some new discoveries there. Can you dive into that? Yeah. Um, so first time CML was discovered or was described clinically, it was back in the 1940s, I think, and it was based on um, a microscopic description of how the cells look like. And back then there was no specific therapy for it, so all they could offer uh, to the people who have it is a kind of cytotoxic drugs, so, so chemotherapy basically, and they were not specific, so they were not changing the outcome of people. Uh, all they were doing is giving them a little bit longer to live uh, a little bit. So they were not effective therapies. It was until the 19, um, late 1990s that the targeted therapies started coming about. And it was a specific tyrosine, target, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So it's a small molecule that targets the, the kinase domain within the diffusion gene that was formed because of the Philadelphia chromosome. So that therapy made all the difference for the CML patients. So they became from people who could live only five years maximum after they've, they've, they've been diagnosed with CML. They now have, because of this therapy, they have an expectancy of life for a, a, a normal person. So that therapy has changed their life. But what that means is because, uh, so that therapy, I should say, is just a pill that you have to take every day. and you live with it. So basically it, it turns CML into the disease to live with. So what happens is now people have to take this medication every day, but that means the implication of that is we have to monitor them closely so that we can, we can see any signs if the disease is going to relapse, so it's going to come back. Um, so we need to monitor them and that's where the lab involvement becomes very important in the lives of these people. Because although the therapy is very effective, it's that there are a proportion of people who relapse, so they lose their initial response, and there are those who progress into aggressive form of the disease. Although they they are a small proportion, but they do some of them. So once they progress to aggressive phase, it becomes like an acute leukemia, so it's very quick, and and, and the life expectancy becomes short um, at that point. But majority of people do well on this therapy. And it changes. It changed the life. It, it's changed their outcome. So let's talk about research methods. Uh, QPCR has long been the gold standard in quantitating um, BCR able. Um, can you kind of dive into the method and its pros and cons in the use here? So when it comes to quantifying molecular targets, real-time QPCR is really effective method. So we em employ this method in our research group to study how does the transcript level decrease. Uh, in the cells that have the Philadelphia chromosome. 
in response to, for example, any uh, inhibitions that inhibitors that we give to the cells. So we want to see, um, in response to inhibitors, how is the what's the kinetics of this uh, transcript, how they are disappearing. So we use real-time qPCR. But as you know, that when you're using real-time qPCR, you need to have a standard curve for each of your for any target you're studying. So that complicates a little bit our life because um, it's not easy to develop, you know, to have a standard curve because you need to use plasmids, for example. And then when you use plasmids, not necessarily the plasmids reflect exactly your uh, DNA or cDNA sample because of the type of the template um, is different. So results you get from the plasmids are not necessarily going to imply uh, going to be applicable to your um, real samples or real real DNA samples. So what happens is that that's one complicated. Well, that's one um, difficulty we face with real time PCR. Another one is when you even if you had the standard curve ready, um, then what happens is um, keeping that standard the same in every lab so we can communicate our results is really difficult. So if we as you know, because you tell when you're using a standard curve, you define the standard curves um, uh, concentrations in each point to tell the machine this is what my concentration is. So it's kind of a um, uh, very subjective issue. So in, in our lab, we might be telling, we might be assigning certain values to our standards, whereas another lab might be um, uh, giving their their standards different. Values. So when we come to um, communicate our data, we end up um, uh, disagreeing because basically we didn't label our samples the same way or we didn't quantify them the same way. So it becomes really um, difficult to communicate. That's one of the main issues we have. So where does digital PCR come into play here? So for us, digital PCR came to be the rescuer or seemed to be like the rescuer because of the promises it gives. So increased sensitivity and uh, absolute quantification, particularly these two areas are what uh, most interest us. And why? So because it's absolute quantification, it helps us get rid of the problem of uh, standard curve. So there's no need anymore to have standard curve to be able to quantify our molecular targets. So no standard curves. Perfect. Uh, the second um, advantage is the quantification low target uh, molecules in the sample. So it increases the sensitivity for us, um, allows us to go quantify deeper and uh, um, uh, be able basically to quantify low, very low level molecules in um, uh, which low level molecules which were before hiding in a background of wild types. Now they are because of the partitioning system that works with the digital PCR, they are able to stand out and express themselves. So we are able to quantify low level things more easily and we are able to quantify them more sensitively. So we can get, uh, instead of having one molecule in 100,000 background, we can now probably quantify one molecule in a million of background cells, which, um, uh, which is a powerful tool for us because when we are monitoring these um, PCR able levels and how they're going down, so when they disappear with RTQPCR, we know that they haven't disappeared completely. It's just that RTQPCR is not allowing us to detect it anymore. So with digital PCR, we can see already with our R&D research that it is possible to detect signals when RTQPCR was saying it's negative or it's not there. So it's kind of it's it's very promising. So we're excited about it. Very nice. Well, yeah. Well, thanks for, for using the uh, Quant Studio 3D digital PCR system and giving us all the great feedback on it, Mary. And uh, if you have any uh, questions from... Oh, go ahead. Yes. Say, thanks, thank you for making it cheaper and affordable for us. <laughs> well, we do what we can. <laughs> um, and thanks for your time today, Mary. If you have any questions for us, uh, leave them at hashtag lab chat on Twitter. And of course, follow Imperial College London at Imperial College. Uh, you can see their little uh, Twitter handle down there wherever you're finding this video. And if you have any questions for us, leave them in the comments section as well. Mary, thanks so much for your time. I'm Jeremy with Thermal Fisher Scientific. Until we chat again.